we're very proud of all three companies that we were manufacturers that we represent. We're a Tirano uh, authorized partner for both the all terrain and the rough terrain uh, crane side. Welcome to episode 61 of The Cranesman Show. Today we have Jason McKenzie. He is the president and owner of Select Crane Sales, and he's here to highlight their vast selection of cranes. They have terrain cranes, hydraulic truck cranes, carry deck cranes, boom trucks, rough terrain cranes, crawler dragline cranes, and tower cranes. But before we can get on with this episode, let's thank our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by none other than Savannah Equipment. Savannah Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world, from placer to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. You can visit them at SavannahEquipment.com to view their entire inventory and find more equipment every day. Next up, we are also sponsored by Power Zone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas, pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit PowerZone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with Power Zone. Visit them at PowerZone.com. Well, let's get on with this episode. Here's Jared Downey and Jason McKenzie. Hello, welcome to the Crownsman Show. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Today on this show, we have Select Cranes. Uh, Jason McKenzie, he is the president and owner. And it's fun to be, uh, it seems like we've been um, doing all the other shows, Mining Now and Crownsman Energy. So it's good to be on the Crownsman Show. Welcome, Jason. How are you today? I'm great, Jared. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's it's great to have you on. You uh, you're you're based in uh, where F uh, Florida and New Jersey. Is that where your company operates out of? That's correct. We're uh, South Florida on the East Coast and uh, Central New Jersey, just outside of New York City. Currently, and, uh, um, what uh, you're right now during the, these times. Um, obviously, it's been a very strange year. Um, uh, funny enough, we're actually filming this episode on election day, which is quite funny. Didn't realize you were setting up that. We're certainly not going to get into politics, but um, what's this year been like for you? I mean, you've been a fairly aggressive. You've, you've, from the conversations we've had, you've actually been growing um, in these very, this very strange year of 2020. Uh, we certainly have. It's been some trying times for us and uh, some things that we've never encountered before, but I, uh, started this company by just hustling and, and working hard and have such a great team. So the goal is to continue the momentum and try to grow larger yet. Um, our, our New Jersey branch, uh, we're quadrupling the size of it and adding on more technicians, uh, more inventory, increasing our rental fleets there. So we're very excited about it. So did you, um, did you start, uh, wh where was the first location? Was it in and New Jersey or Florida? Actually, Florida was. Uh, I'm originally a Northeast guy, born and raised in New York. But when I decided to go out on my own and start Select Crane, uh, certainly wanted to come down to warmer weather. So mm -hmm. selfishly, I relocated to South Florida and made our main office here in Fort Pierce. And then started to get a little bit of a following down here while continuing to focus on my business in the Northeast because it's always been a good source for me. And oh, sorry. Go ahead. With no, oh, no worries. Uh, so with that, uh, we added on our second branch about a year and a half after the inception of Select Grain. So um, I mean, there must be a fair amount of construction. I mean, Florida is a pretty booming state as well. So there's there's a lot of opportunity out out in that state as well, is there not? There certainly is. I mean, this tourism is very large down here. Uh, good portion of the population from the Northeast or all other parts of the country are relocating here every day. So home building and, and residential construction is, uh, seems to be constantly growing at a very rapid pace. What is, I, I, I'm always interested. I've, I've been to New York and I never, uh, I never have been to New Jersey and I just, I, I should know my geography a little bit better, but there's, there's, I know there's a real strategic advantage to being located in, in New Jersey. So can you sort of set that up strategically as a company? What, what's the advantage sort of what the reach is in that, in that uh, region? 
Absolutely. Uh, so we do a fair amount of business in New York City in the immediate surrounding area. We have such a, a large population density there because of the city and, and the, the different businesses and industry that's there. So because the real estate is so expensive in New York, it doesn't make sense to be in the city or immediately outside. We chose a location in New Jersey about 40 minutes west of the city. And that sets us up very strategically to service not only New York City, lower Connecticut, the lower half of New York State, but also for Eastern Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Philadelphia region, uh, Delaware, Maryland, and uh, you know all within a two or two and a half hour uh, commute. So it plays very well for us. You have does each uh, does each area that you service each state um, does it change? Um, are, are there a lot of different cranes going from? I mean, New York is obviously going to be, I would think, more tower cranes um, and that. But what, like states like Pennsylvania, are you putting more of the the all terrain ones, or is it pretty even across each state? It's pretty even. Uh, it, yes, you have a, a very large amount of tower cranes in New York, but you also have a large amount of mobile cranes and crawler cranes to not only support those, but to perform the after the building work. Mm. Um, you know, the erection of the building is only one part of it. After that, there has to be maintenance and in, in, installing or changing out air conditioning units and air handlers, um, you know, things like that. So our focus with tower crane specifically has certainly been greater in the New York market, but we do, the same type of machines in New York and Florida and Connecticut and Boston. It's, uh, you know, it's a very wide variety in all of those areas. I was going to ask you, um, circling back to, you know, just the, this very strange year, I mean, a globally, a globally strange year in 2020. Um, and, uh, the, I mean, especially here in Canada, we get the, we get a lot of news coming out of the U S and that, and, when you have this, um, you know, obviously businesses are struggling, um, although, I mean, the, the GDP just came out, it's only down three and a half percent or something in the U.S., which is crazy how well the U.S. has done financially through this time. Um, but how do you sort of approach it um, as, as a business owner, especially in that heavy industrial um, construction sector and that? sort of is there that temptation to wait or or when you see this sort of stuff happening um is it sort of like it's time to really push hard what's sort of your your personal approach to this it, it really it's almost a contradictory approach jared you want to be smart and you want to reserve cash and you want to be able to pull back from the market and kind of wait and see what happens and that's a tough discipline to follow especially because there is still so much going on and you're having, you know, in our business, we own the majority of our inventory, whether it's for rental or whether it's for resale. And when times like this hit, certain companies start to panic or you see different sectors like the, the gas and oil industries mm -hmm. really kind of tanked right now because of the lack of travel and, and consumption. So there's becomes really good deals and buys out there. And it's tempting to go out and take everyone you can because ideally you'd like to make a larger margin or be able to flip the inventory. Um, we try to be calculated with it. And I say we, my whole team tries to strategize and continue to grow and move forward, but educatedly and, and without being completely careless. Some of it's almost blind. I mean, I'm a big believer that the days you don't turn on the news and you just go to work are the days that are more productive and more successful than the days that you sit there and watch the news and the stock ticker and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you, and I, I know this from it. You can't deny it in the line of work I'm in because if I listen to the news, when I come in to do these shows, I am just, I'm, it's just a, a completely different energy that I, I come into the show with. I'm I enjoy doing it. I'm into the interview and I'm engaged with the audience. If I listen to the news on that 20 minute drive, pretty much half the life is sucked out of me by the time I get here. I so understand completely. I, and you'll understand being election day here. That's this morning was very tough to listen to it coming in and then try to tune it out in time to, to uh, have I our cast. I didn't even clue in about it, honestly. But 
But it's also sort of fitting because, um, you know, all this, this, if you watch the news and then you're looking at a business like yourself, you're still operating. The bills still need to be paid. You still need to take care of your employees and your customers. You're still out there looking for purchases. And you, you said something really interesting um, about all these new opportunities. And I'm, I'm assuming you mean uh, inventory uh, coming up that you could purchase. Is that what you were referring to? That's correct. In fact, I mean, we, last week we bought a package of 13 units. Well, uh, because you're seeing some sectors become idle with their fleets, uh, specifically, again, gas and oil, yeah. um, there becomes some deals that almost are too good to be true or at least make it worth swallowing and, and taking, the, uh, taking the risk on. Yeah. Now, if they continue to stay down and anything else happens, then then it's a whole different ball game and it's regrouping again. But from what we're seeing, you know, even through recent events this year, as strange as it's been, construction has stayed very steady. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of work already in progress. And 2020 was planned to be a fantastic year, kind of across the board, uh, at least up until later in the year with the election. So most companies had more work than they can handle. And the plan was, for everyone to continue to grow this year and then see what happened in the fall. Unfortunately, we all know that got stopped a little bit early, but uh, you know, now we, we sit here trying to look into next year and see what happens, how everything rebounds. Yeah, it, it seems like you have, you have a good approach because that really is what it is, that balance of, yeah, you, you don't want to ignore, when, when things are at a discount, you do not want to ignore them, but you also, you can't, you can't uh, sort of sell the farm you know, to buy the horse kind of thing, right? That's 100% correct. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, just, just to kind of understand a little more of what Select Cranes is doing because you, you do sell globally. I mean, a lot of it's, I'm, I'm sure, local. You're, you're probably not shipping a ton of cranes over across to, let's say, California. Or, but what is sort of, what's that sort of balance um, between uh, the, your global business and your local business? So that's actually changed quite a bit since we've, uh, since we started, uh, select crane turned four years old in August and, uh, it's been quite the wild ride. Uh, when we started, we were very sectorized. It was the Northeast, New York, New Jersey with established customer base there. And it was Florida for this new customer base and a very little bit of export business from customers I've dealt with in the past. Uh, looking at today, we're probably 10% export to countries like Egypt and India, some South Africa, uh, a little bit of the Caribbean islands. That, that, that's actually pretty high, 10%. 10 that's, that's a fair amount of product that actually is going overseas. It, I mean, again, that's 10% out of our whole business, but it's, uh, you know, we're happy with it. We'd always like to see that increase a little more, but we'd like to see all business increase. The areas that we've seen growth in, in what continues to surprise me and, and, and be a testament to what everybody at Select Crane has worked for is you know, being primarily an East Coast based business, our reaches have gotten out to the West Coast of the US and we're shipping machines to Arizona, Wisconsin, California, Ohio, uh, the Dakotas. And that's been such a welcome change because I'm not actively going to see a customer out there. That's someone who's found us on the internet or gotten one of our direct emails. And we've been able to put a deal together without even meeting the person uh, most of the time. And that's kind of exciting for us. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's huge. Is I, I'm wondering, um, you, you talked about buying, buying inventory, looking for the right price and that what is your competitive advantage? I mean, obviously there's, there's tons of crane companies out, out th throughout the U S and so what, uh, what do you think gets that deal done uh, beyond the point of that they found you online or, you know, hopefully they see this show and, you know, things like that. But beyond that, what, um, what do you think gets that deal done? Is it your ability to, to buy something at the right price so that you can offer it to them a good value? Or is this like rental? Is it sales? Like what, what kind of business are you doing when you push further West? Most of the stuff looking out West is we've been fortunate and it's more reputation than anything. Mm. Uh, we've got a really good customer following and a good name in the market. And because of that, if we say we're going to do something, we do it. Uh, we've kind of got a no BS approach to it. 
it's a cut and dry thing. I'm not here to lie. My whole team is straightforward, straight shooting. And that has seemed to really play well for us uh, with new customers and repeat customers. It's just the same. You know, you, uh, it's, you can always, there, there's kind of two ways you can tell how a company deals with things is obviously by their owners, but then also the people that are around them when you're dealing with them. And um, I, I have to say, um, Shelly on your team, when she did the show outline for, for us, um, most people do the bare minimum. They sort of submit the photos and then we have to piece it all together. She had all the talking points that we wanted to touch on. And then she had the list of every picture in the other column. I was like, wow. Okay. And that, but that speaks, it speaks when somebody um, is working with us and they're fully engaged. And is that something that you, uh, how would I say it? Is it something do you think that you bring or is it something you look for um, in people that sort of have that level of engagement on your team? I, I honestly think it's a little bit of both. I'm an all in type of person. Uh, this business is my life. It's, I love this industry and I'm so heavily invested, not just financially, but with the time that I spend and in the relationships with the customers and you know, my phone's on 24 seven. I, if there's ever an issue, I want to deal with it head on. It, I look for the same qualities and team members. And I think we all play off of each other in, in a way, you know, Shelly, I've known for years and years, we worked together at a previous employer and uh, prior her, to her joining the team, we had always kind of joked around about, oh, someday you're going to come work for me. Someday we're going to be back together again. And when we pulled the trigger on that last, uh, late last year, it was so welcome for me because her talents and, and her drive are unmatched out there. And to have somebody to sit there, it's almost, I laugh, it's almost like having my mom here. She keeps <laughs> me in line. She keeps me in check. If I forget to do something or if she thinks I did, then she's all over me to make sure it gets done. And and at the same time, she's off doing her own thing. She doesn't work in our office. She works remotely. Mm. And yet, she, you wouldn't know that. You would think that she sits at the desk next to me every day. I actually did. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I want to, you know, I, I, would actually, I, want, I have one more question about that. Is sure. um, there is, there's people that are all in on their companies. And again, we, we get to talk a little bit leading up to shows. So you kind of get to know, know the people. Um, I get to say, I kind of get to have like best friends for about two weeks and mm -hmm. then sometimes I don't talk to them for about another year, but, um, and it's very clear. You are an all in person on this, on this company. And I see two types of results of that. There's people that when they're all in, it's almost overpowering to a team. Because they're just like, they're, they're so aggressive. It's almost like hard for people to keep up. And then there's the type of people that are all in and seem to be able to pull everybody with them. And I know this is a sort of an on the spot question, but is that something that you, is that something that you actively think about? Like when you're going all in, are you also looking for ways, consciously looking for ways to, to engage the team as well? Or, or are you primarily trying to lead by example? Uh, honestly, I think it's a little bit of both. And, and because we have such great people here and everybody cares so much that the same focus or, or the same end result is the desire of everyone. And that makes it exciting for me. Um, sure, I've got a pretty strict attention to detail and, and trying to catch anything that we may miss or you know an individual may miss. And there's times where that gets pointed out, but as a whole, we're like a big family. Everybody here looks out for the rest of the people on the team. They want this as a whole to survive. This isn't just someone getting a paycheck or this isn't just building a company. So the owner has a better life. This is really a culture that everybody wants this place to succeed and they take it personally. And, you know, if you look at specifically the events of earlier this year and the difficult decisions that had to be made by companies and business owners. Yeah. Uh, you know, we watched our competitors laying people off, uh, furloughing, things like that. I made a very difficult decision to not lay anyone off. I wanted to use that time to not only catch up on anything that we backlog, specifically in our shop basis, but to make sure that nobody's quality of life or the way they operated day to day on the team was affected. And it was expensive. 
and it was a risk and we didn't know how long we could sustain it, especially if there wasn't the normal sales going on, which there weren't, but every single team member recognized that commented about it and also approached me in their own way to say, if you need us to take some time off, if you need us to work without pay for a while, we're, we're in like we oh. were there. And so that's, that's the kind of atmosphere that this whole place has. And, and, you know, all our locations, I say all our locations, Florida, New Jersey, the folks that work remotely. So it's, uh, it's, that's, that's it. No, it, no it's, it's, it's inspiring. And it's, uh, and the reason I'm sort of digging into it a little bit, because, you know, you can, you can just tell some people it's a genuine, um, it's genuine where they're coming from. And so when I see that, I, I like to unpack a little bit because it's, it makes a difference. There's a lot of people that are watching the show that are trying to inspire their team. And, you know, and I, I think there's a lot of um, probably there's too much in like these LinkedIn streams filling up with inspiration. You know, it's a, a 10 second read or two second quote, and it's just not enough um, to really, to really show people how you do inspire a team and how you collaborate with your team and lead. And so I, I think it's important, but I do want to get over to, um, I want to talk a little bit about your, your rental fleet. Cause there's something I, I don't, I've always wondered about cranes. I've been up on, I've been up on lifts and going, I wonder what happened um, last time. <laughs> Cause I've seen people operating the lifts, how they sometimes can treat the equipment mm -hmm. that I know is rental. Cause I see the rental company on the side. And then I'm up in a week later, I'm up in the similar machine going, oh boy. Okay. Um, so what is that process that you have um, when it's, these units are going out on rental, when they come back um, to, to inspect them and make sure they're, they're up to standards and everything when they're going out on another job site? So we have the same approach with our rental equipment as we do the anything we're buying used for resale. So I'm going to kind of pull those into one if you're okay with it. Um, again, we're, we're very big on reputation and very cautious about liability and big on safety and anything that goes with that. We're in a dangerous business and we're dealing with big, heavy equipment that lifts big and heavy things. So if we have a peace pool in this yard to, or New Jersey's yard, uh, to be sold or to be rented, we really go through the machine top to bottom, not only to do an oil change and, you know, check the brakes on a mobile crane or check the cable on a, on a, a telescopic boom machine, but we're checking cylinders and hoses. We're, we're, we're checking hydraulic functions and making sure that everything's running at the proper speeds and pressures that it's supposed to. We're making sure the engines are proper on them and, and serviced and up to date. We're scoping the booms out and, and checking for wear pads to make sure they're in the correct positions that there's not anything missing, that there's not loose hardware. And, you know, I always kind of equated it that if you go buy a, a certified used vehicle and it's had its 101 point inspection, we're much the same. It, it's more than 101 points, but we spend two to four to 10 days going through a machine, depending on, you know, how it arrives here to make sure that everything's proper, to make sure that it's safe, to make sure it's going to be, a reliable machine when it goes out to the rental customer or when it gets sold to its new owner. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I realize that you wouldn't always, I mean, see that the crane coming back, you know, especially in the New Jersey location that, but how often, again, it's one of these things, this is just for my own personal yeah. curiosity. How often do you, does it come back and you, you'll hear feedback from your team? Just do people beat on these things are they pretty hard on them or are most companies because it is such a dangerous piece of equipment? It really is. Is there a, is, are most companies pretty, uh, pretty focused on, on the safety and taking care of the equipment or does it happen that they come back pretty beat up sometimes? I, on a majority, it, these machines are either coming from or going to companies that have qualified staff to operate them that have their own maintenance uh, checks and procedures in place. And that's, it, that's who we want to deal with. I'm not going to lie and say that we don't sell a machine or we don't 
buy a machine that you know, the tree care industry is the hardest industry in the world on a crane because they tend to run it more like a cowboy and flopping the boom around and, and a little less finesse than crane or construction companies do. But I'm not putting the crane, the, the tree care industry down with it either. They're a very large group that we service and, uh, you know, a large consumer of these machines across the, uh, the entire country. But uh, it's always a whole, we're fortunate. You know, we deal with the right people. We deal with good people and, and the equipment comes back or arrives uh, pretty well maintained and in pretty decent condition. Wait, I mean, a, a company like yours, Jason, is it, uh, again, there's just these things that, I mean, you kind of, when you see a crane company, you, you see a whole bunch of lifts. I mean, when I, when I go, when I go out, um, when I pass these uh, rental places, I mean, it's, it's almost like they're almost always, I would say 80% full. And I'm always, um, so it's a, a big part of your business must be trying to figure out what units, like, do you, how do you even choose what units um, that should be out on uh, available and which ones to buy and that? I mean, it be, because there's so many options and people need all this, the, the different units for different purposes. So how do you actually uh, build your fleet up? Is it strategic? Are there sort of some core pieces you start with and then over four years, you just keep adding them on or, or how do you approach it? That uh, you try to be strategic. We're a little different in the fact that we're not strictly a rental company. Granted, we're a bare rental. We rent to someone else who puts their own operator in. We're not an operated rental company. Mm -hmm. So we're an equipment supplier and that's kind of our, our niche or where we hold tight. Everything in our yard for the most part with a few exceptions is available to be rented or mm -hmm. available for sale. So, you know, if our yard's full, yeah, we don't like to see it that way because it means nothing's selling or nothing's out on rent. But we also need to have inventory to sell. You don't go to a, a used car lot and if there's no cars there, you don't stop to buy a vehicle. We're the same way. If we don't have inventory on the ground, then nobody's going to come here to look. Uh, so we try to have a variety of machines to fill all the markets that we are looking to service. We don't always have the right piece. We watch market or industry trends to make sure that we have the right sizes, uh, to make sure we have the right type of crane. Uh, you know, believe it or not, different areas prefer different brands of cranes. So you know, in the Northeast, we might focus on one manufacturer and in the Southeast, we might stock more of a different manufacturer. So we're careful to do that. You know, as far as building the fleet, it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> It's, you never, you never have the right machine. It's, you never have the, uh, because we're heavy in the, in the tower crane side up in, especially in the New York area. Yeah. We have a lot of parts and components for those mm. just sitting and they take up big yard space. Yeah. And when they're out on rent, it's great. But when they're not on rent, it's just sitting there staring at you in the face. And, uh, you know, so that, that plays into it because we've got a large investment there, in tower sections and tie collars and things like that. And, uh, and then when it comes to the mobile side of things and the crawlers and things like that, we you try to have a good variety and hope that it's the right one. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, is it one of those businesses too, that it does come in, comes in waves? Like, uh, you, you got units starting to build up and you're thinking, okay, we need, and then all of a sudden someone needs all three different people need the same unit. I'm sure that happens. Very much. It, it's a very much when it rains, it pours industry. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you mentioned the brands and I want to talk a little bit um, because you've got, I mean, you've got some, I mean, uh, Sedano cranes for one. I mean, that's a, that's a real heavyweight brand. So I want to talk a little bit about your, uh, the, the crane lines. Um, and also just the relationship that you have with these companies uh, to be able to, to provide their units. Um, so I think, uh, what, what are the three brands you carry? And then let's, let's sort of break down each one. Absolutely. So uh, we're very proud of all three companies that we were manufacturers that we represent. We're a Tadano uh, authorized partner for both the all-terrain and the rough terrain uh, crane side. We're a wolf crane uh, stocking dealer. Uh, for the Wolf Crane Tower Cranes that are manufactured in Heilbronn, Germany. And we're also a Daiichi telehandler dealer, uh, Daiichi products manufactured in Italy. And all three kind of 
complement different sectors that we deal with. I've uh, been very fortunate to represent all three, especially being still fairly new in this industry as a company, not me per se, but as a company. It, uh, it, let, let's let's start with uh, let's start with um, well, let's start with bull crane because that's uh, the, the tower cranes are awesome. Um, <laughs> so how do you? I mean, obviously, I'm not trying to get into the secret sauce or anything like that. But um, but how do you sort of build out that relationship with them? I mean, especially being a new company, four four years. I mean, especially in the crane business, it is full. We've had crane companies on. I mean, they go way back. <laughs> they do. Usually multi generational, and yeah. uh, you either had to marry in or you had to be born into it. So exactly. exactly. Um, <laughs> so. I'm curious, how do you how do you build that relationship um, as such a young company with such a major, um, you know, the Tadanos and the Wolfcrans and that? Um, you know, how do you build that relationship? So I was very fortunate, without going too much into the past of it, I, uh, at least not right now, I've been in this industry for 13 years. And the place I was before here, I was very much allowed to run it, or at least my section of it, like it was my own company. Mm. And at the time, you know, looking at Wolf Crane specifically, uh, this would have been eight years ago, they were looking to, to re-enter the U.S. market and have a big presence. And I caught wind of it. And I approached them to make my previous employer a, a dealer for them. And I spent some time and some nagging and a little bit of coercion to make sure that they gave us a dealership line and was able to sell a fair amount of their units over the course of a few years. When it came time to go out on my own, uh, it was kind of a natural fit. They knew that I was the one that focused on that product, that I had the clientele for it. And uh, so it was kind of natural that they would let Select Crane become a partner and then eventually a dealer for them. And I've continued with my commitment to them you know, from day one. I, I started, uh, we have, half a million dollars worth of their parts on the shelf. Well, uh, you know, 20 or 30 tower sections, tie collars. I mean, we, we service our customer base and, and their customer base uh, very committedly. Is it, um, is, you know, it's, it's when, when you're driving, you know, you, you know, take somewhere like Toronto or New York that you see cranes just everywhere. Um, these tower cranes. Um, it's sort of, I mean, from someone like me, when you're just looking out into the distance, a crane is a crane. Um, what takes a brand like a, a Wolf Crane? Um, I mean, as soon as you hear German manufacturer that, I mean that right away, there, there's a certain quality that people expect from that. Mm -hmm. But what do you sort of, and not just from the product itself, but just as a company, what sort of do you think separates them out? Because they are one of these long generation, oh, I don't know about multi gener. I don't know about their like the family in that, but they're one of these companies that have been around for a long time. Um, they're so, the inventor of the modern tower crane. Right. They, yeah. I mean, it, it, their design and, and their cranes have, you know, they're over a hundred years old and they've been kind of the, I don't want to say the founders of the market, but it, the tower crane that everybody knows today, no matter what manufacturer is based off of their design. Oh, that's, that's crazy. Um, and what, what do you think it is about them that makes them such that, that longevity? And, and is there something that you've maybe even learned from them dealing with a company like that? Uh, I mean, they, they have a very high quality and very high quality control to their product. Mm. All of the brands we represent for the most part uh, or for all part do. They, they put out a product that, isn't full of problems and something that you have to chase. You know, it's, we call it, we sell a new machine and we've got to go chase it with a service technician for six months dealing with little problems and you know, issues that go wrong with it. It can be a nightmare for us because we have other things we focus on. Wolf Crane, Sedano, and even the Daiichi product, they've all been very reliable for us. Not to say they don't have a small issue here or there, but you know, Wolf Crane specifically has a, a, a very high, uh, quality of product. They're well engineered. They uh, have safety factors and the way they operate and the way they erect that other brands do not. And that to us, you know, gives us a, the edge up on the competition. We're not the cheapest brand. They're probably the most expensive brand out there in tower cranes, mm. but it's the best and you pay for what you get. Yeah. 
Well, I, I, I wouldn't think when you're building a tower, you want to, you want the cheapest tower cranes. <laughs> you'd, you'd hope not, but we're in a strange world. So <laughs> that's, that, that, that's true. And then what about Tadano? I mean, their, their units are, uh, they, they've got some pretty interesting units because they do these all terrain and they've kind of got a mixture of um, off, off terrain and uh, sorry, I should have made a note. For how to... Don't worry. Right, uh, rough, so they have a rough terrain product, which is two or three axle machines that are produced in uh, Japan. And uh, anybody who's familiar with pulling a product out of Japan it, it knows that they will not put the product out in market unless it's been thoroughly tested and made sure that it is ready. They Japanese hold uh, themselves to a whole different level. And uh, so we've been uh, an authorized selling partner for about three years for them on the rough terrain side. And then shortly after we became the same for the all terrain crane side and the all terrain cranes go anywhere from four axles up to six. Mm. And those are the big wheel machines that you'd see driving down the road with the booms in them most of the time and, or up your way, the booms over the back into a dolly and uh, you know, 200, 250 foot boom lengths and hundred and something foot of jib. Absolutely insane. Um, so, so as an authorized dealer, and I'm just trying to understand this, uh, is so if you're if you're a dealer for for them, um, then if somebody from that is it an area thing that you? So they have two different versions. They have an authorized dealer, uh, which we are for Wolfgren, and then there's another thing known as a selling partner, authorized partner, which is what we are for Tirano. We don't have a specific territory. Uh, to cover. We are pretty fortunate in the fact that our guidelines are a little looser as far as where we sell machines. Uh, although we do respect a lot of the actual dealers that do have dedicated territories because we're friendly or have good relationships with them and certainly don't want to step on anyone's toes. And we also like to sell a lot where we can service. We don't want to leave a customer high and dry. And if we don't have the ability to service ourselves or have uh, someone in, you know, quote unquote, our network or uh, that's a friend to us that can cover it, then it might be something that we're not involved with. I, I going back to Dodano, I mean, there's, um, I don't know how else to ask the question. How good are their products? I mean, they've got that reputation in the industry. So compared to, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's going to be companies that are right along with them in quality. Um, you know, these, I mean, there's other high-end uh, manufacturers. But compared to, let's say, the lowest version of, of what they sell, how much better would one of their units be um, than the, you know, the lower, the, you know, the three-tier down version of the same that has similar lifting capacity and all that sort of stuff? They're the best. I mean, you know, looking at the rough terrain crane specifically, it, I hate to say bulletproof because it always comes back to bite me a little bit, but it, we sell a new rough terrain crane and we sell the guy a spare set of filters and that's about it. If you keep that fluid changed and, and, and the filters changed on the service intervals, there's virtually nothing that goes wrong with these machines. And we're seeing used machines, used Tadanos we have in our, in our rental fleet or our sales uh, inventory that are 2000, 2001, 12, 14, 15, 16,000 hours on them and still haven't had any cylinder leaking issues, haven't had any engine issues. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, they're, they're amazing units. I just wanted to bring up, um, I should be able to say, and then the telehandlers. You see, I was glad when you sold, sold the telehandlers because it's the only uh, type of equipment here that I've actually, I've actually driven, you know, tearing down mines, picking up motors and things like that. So I have some experience with these. Um, Talk a little bit about their brand. Um, and now this is, they're pretty, I mean, these telehandlers are used anything from agriculture to construction to, you know, back in, you know, equipment yards, picking stuff out. I mean, they're just used for everything. Um, sort of what's that, what's the setup that you have with them and, and a little bit about their product as well. So we became a Daiichi dealer about two years ago. Uh, the, the telemarket and, or the, the telehandler market and the rotating telehandlers, uh, have become enormously popular. Uh, companies can put someone in them that maybe isn't a trained operator in certain areas or doesn't have the level of qualification that a crane operator has. Really? 
And so it becomes a more versatile machine. I know it's a little scary, but it happens. <laughs> um, it, you know, you're, you're also doing, especially looking at residential construction and, and uh, you know, large bridge jobs and things like that. They become a very versatile tool. Uh, we took the product on because we wanted that entry into markets that we weren't in because like you said, everybody can use one of these, yeah, whether it is agricultural and they're working in the citrus fields down here in Florida or it's industrial application and it, they're using it to move pallets around uh, a yard up in central Jersey. You know, even as far as building the rotating telehandlers, we have uh, man baskets attachments for them with remote controls. We have four ton winch attachments for them, uh, buckets, things like that. So they, you can kind of find an application for every person out there that has a use for a machine. Did that, um, what did that do for your business? Is it, is it still new that pe- that you are carrying that line or did that have a pretty quick impact um, on revenue uh, once you brought them in? It, uh, it's a little twofold to be honest with you. It opened some doors for us for places that we hadn't been able to get into before, which was fantastic. We haven't done as great of a job with the product as I would like to, and it has nothing to do with the product itself. It just has to do with where our focus is. And because we are so heavy in the cranes and boom trucks and things like that, uh, the ability to stop at every single customer that could use one of these and explain the benefits of it kind of becomes second or third hand. And it's unfortunate we're working to change that and we're working with our marketing of it and some different ideas to do a better job with the product. Yeah, it's um, yeah, exactly. It's one of those. And that's what I was thinking when you were kind of, I was when I saw that you were one of the deals for them, I thought everything else is very specific, like a tower crane. I mean, if there's a thousand towers in tower cranes in New York, it's still only a thousand. Right. And that probably breaks down to, I don't even know. I wish there's a thousand. I think there's probably 40 or 45 tower cranes standing in New York. Cranes is a general. There's probably a thousand in the region. Um, Yeah. But But yeah, actual actual tower. Yeah. Tower cranes is not. um, There's probably, you know, I think right now in New York city, there's 45 or 50 tower cranes standing up. It's funny. A few years ago, uh, Toronto actually had the most tower cranes out of any uh, city for a little mm-hmm. while. I don't think now it, it was, and I remember going there and there was just towers everywhere. Yeah. A thousand. I don't know where that number. Came, but. <laughs> I love it. Listen, if it was <laughs> Wolf crane has about 20% of the market in New York. So if, uh, if there's a thousand, that means we did really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good year. But yeah, I was thinking with the teller handler market, it's so, um, yeah, I mean, even more to my point, if there's, there's only 40, it's, you know, 20% is 80. I mean, or, right. eight. um, <laughs> So with that, it's such a big market, which can actually be almost more challenging because it's really hard to direct market and direct connect with them, right? It is. And there's a lot of competition as well with those. Yeah. There, you know, there's, there's three Italian brands sold in the States now where there never was, you know, there was one forever. You have multiple brands that are manufactured in the U.S. Uh, that have been known forever. And uh, it is, it is something that, you need to have some kind of direction on and I hope it doesn't become one of those things where it's, you know, do what you do best and don't, don't get into too much. I'm hoping that we evolve a better market for it. And you know, we see that happening gradually, but uh, you know, I, again, it served its purpose to a point so far. Now it's just us trying to capitalize and make it a little better. Yeah. It's all, yeah. Um, the, the industries you serve are going kind of expanding on that. The, the industries that you've served, um, I mean, uh, is there, is, in four years, have there been a couple projects that stand out or a couple industries that you, you've, you've sort of seen your, your business doing well in? And, um, but even if there was a specific project that you kind of go, wow, we get to be a, a bit of a part of that. Um, has there been projects like that? I, because we deal in such a, a vast variety of industry, it's tough to pick out just one or two. I mean, every single project that I see a crane on that we had some part of gets exciting for me. And luckily my team feels the same exact way. You know, we deal with everything from general construction, tree care industry, home building, uh, developers on high rises, uh, uh, oil and gas, you name it. If there's a reason to have a crane there, or if we can find a reason to have a crane there, then we try to be involved with it. I mean, certainly the tower crane 
aspect of it has been exciting, especially with some of the projects in New York, uh, seeing uh, things down in the, the Brooklyn area developed and, and how many high rises are there now and different projects that cranes that I or we have supplied uh, to some of our great customers up there built is, uh, is certainly exciting. And, you know, there's nothing like walking around the city or flying in and being able to kind of count out which ones you had a part of. And, uh, you know, especially when you're looking at some of the tower heights now that are six, seven, 800 feet tall. It's That's uh, so crazy. It's pretty wild. I, I went to, uh, I went to New York, uh, last, well, when was that? Uh, last, last 2019, I guess. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then I came back to Vancouver and it just, it looked, I, I never seen Vancouver looking so tiny, <laughs> just it, like, it seemed almost funny. Like it was just like, you, you walk through New York, I just, I'll never forget driving from, you know, when you hear about, you see it in the movies, but you can't capture it until you're actually mm -hmm. there. It's, and I remember driving, uh, back to the airport and just, it just goes for, it's like, it's just on and on just these huge buildings. It's absolutely incredible. It's absolutely there's, incredible. There's still a couple, you know, it, it, I'm from upstate New York. It's about four hours North, uh, West of, of the city. So when I was young, I had never gotten the opportunity to go and always wanted to. And when I got into the crane industry and that became part of my territory, it was certainly exciting for me because now I was going to be technically working in New York or in and around it. And, there's a couple of spots on the drive that give you this vantage point, the whole skyline, uh, especially yeah. coming from the West, coming in New yep. Jersey, like Route three, and you come up over this hill and all of a sudden all you're looking at, and it looks like you can reach out and touch it. And you're just looking at high rise on top of high rise. And it still gives me that little bit of uh, excitement in the chest to kind of see it. And, you know, this is where you're at. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of what I say. It's like when you go to Vegas, there's these huge buildings, but it's all on optical illusion. Cause when you go around them, they're, they're narrow and all that yeah, right. stuff, right? It's all a trick. Um, but in New York, it's real. <laughs> like the, I think the Supreme court is there like that, that building is just unbelievable. Like it just, it blows me away. I, I could, uh, I could spend a lot more time there. Um, I want to talk, talk, Jason, just, we talked a little bit about your career. We kind of ended up, uh, usually we keep that at the end, but I, I we kind of got into it a little bit sooner. Um, but when you, what was it like for you? You, you mentioned that you'd been in the industry for, you've been in the industry for 13 years. So you'd been nine years, um, before that. Day one, day one, you've got, um, you start your company. What is that feeling like? And I think it's a little different for everybody. But so for you, what was it like your day one? Now you're going to own a crane company and um, you're going to make partnerships. You're going to make connections. You're going to get business deals done. You've got to build the team on and on. It was, um, what's it that was, what the heck did I just do with my life? <laughs> it's a, uh... Kind of what happened. Um, it, it was exciting. And it, honestly, it didn't, uh, you know, Jared, you and I talked, and I think we're going to touch on it a little after, but it, being in the industry for a while, I certainly had some kind of confidence in, you know, I can go out and I can sell cranes and I'll always be okay. Mm. But it's different when you're working for someone else and you don't have the responsibilities that you do when you own the company. And I, I you know, when this, when I started this, it was a six foot plastic folding table in a, apartment in New Jersey. And, you know, my wife was there next to me and I had a laptop, a printer, a cell phone, and no employees, uh, no product lines. I had an investor that was willing to back me so I could buy some inventory. And it was basically gambling and it never hit me. That was the, the nervous funny hearing this. <laughs> yeah, that's, and the funny part was like, I was never nervous about it. Really? Then. Yeah. Everybody I knew, and I was pretty successful where I was before. So everybody I knew was, what are you doing? Like, you've got a great job. You're making decent money. Are, are you, are you worried on? I wasn't. Mm. And, you know, so that, that was the, the folding table in New Jersey was uh, the first week of July of six, 2016. The first week of August, we moved into our condo in Florida with a 18 foot trailer behind us with everything we had ever owned in the trailer. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we graduated to a glass dining room table. Uh, there was a big upgrade at the time. Yeah. Uh, we got to put the folding table away and hired our first salesperson at the time. I love those folding tables. They're handy. I do. They're very handy. I still have it. And uh, <laughs> actually, the, I'll give you a stupid story about this chair after. But uh, <laughs> so um, it, even then, it was we had sold a few cranes in the beginning, and we're gonna. It's gonna be great. And it was about eight months after. And at that time, we had sold. I don't even know, 40 or 50 cranes. Wow. And, and I remember sitting back one night and going, what the hell did I do? Like I quit everything. I quit a decent paycheck. I, you know, good commission checks. I left everything I knew to move to a state where we had a few friends, but no real support network and started this company on a whim. And it, it was good because we were successful right from the beginning, but then it all kind of settled in and, that's when reality uh, hit. And then I haven't slept since. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's almost, you almost go numb. It's almost such a, it's, it's, it's almost such a rush that it, it takes some time before it settles in. You know, it's funny. Um, and now watch the next guest on the show is going to be like completely single, uh, you know, ne never had any sort of support from a partner. And so I'm going to have to eat my words. <laughs> interesting. You, again, one of these things you'll see is like, you get, I actually hear advice. This is what amazed me. Older people, I will hear advice, not all, but I've heard it where they're, t they're telling people like, stay single as long as you can, you know, all this sort of stuff. And every person who's been on the show that has started something has had the support of a spouse, every mm -hmm. single one, not with no exception so far. In the show. So, so do you want the caveat to that question now? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. she's no longer a current spouse. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> hang on, hang, hang on, hang on. However, <laughs> she sits at the office across the hall from me. She still runs our entire office, handles all our HR, all our a, uh, AR and AP. There is nobody in this world that trusts more with any of it than her. She still takes a feel of ownership, even though she's just an employee or a team member at this point. So there's a little bit of a caveat, but yeah, she's still there, still supporting, which is good. I, I, I pretty, I, in a weird way, I think you made my point even more though. <laughs> <laughs> good point. I was trying. I wanted to make sure. I gave you all, all ends of it now. <laughs> I like how you let me go the whole thing. <laughs> I was going to. It's a sales guy for you. I'll let you grab that hook and run with it a little bit. Yeah, and then exactly. we'll really <laughs> yeah. yeah. And as a host, I'm really going to grab it. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, I mean, I mean, good, good for you. That's, that's sort of an interesting thing. Um, but going back, Jason, too, is just is sort of, I want to take even a, a step further back um, of where you started your career, because I, to sort of wrap up the show, um, it's always an important part to, to understand how someone got there. Something, it's just a, a little bit of a personal thing on the show, is that I, I always want someone watching to not get a feeling um, and not that I'm anti-inspiration um, or anything like that. I just want people, especially younger people that are watching and sort of thinking about going on their own, to see the work that goes in and see what those little steps that people take to develop their, themselves to be ready for it. So where did you start your career? What was that sort of that, that linear journey that brought you to having this company? Well, and I thank you so much for asking this because honestly, this is, this is one of those things where – to take a look at everything now and see the company that's built and, and is successful and, and that really gets through some difficult times. It's it, people think it just, it just got here. They don't understand how they don't, you know, unfortunately you interview people and they think that they're going to start at the top and they don't understand what working from the ground up is. And I'm a big believer in working from the ground up. I, uh, I was always a driven young person and, doing odd jobs in the neighborhoods and things like that. When I turned 18, I started a landscaping company in central New York. And uh, at the time, I didn't realize this, but I had two out of three great qualities. I was a really good salesperson and I was a really good worker, but I was a horrible businessman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I went through four, four and a half years of this landscaping company, building it and having employees and having all of these grand accounts up in, in New York that, guys who've been in the business 20 years couldn't figure out how, how I got them. Well, I figured it out. I didn't understand cash flow. I didn't understand credit. And there was literally a period of about three weeks where I had three big sizable dollar amount jobs going on. And all three of them, for lack of better words, stiffed me. 
And I, uh, I was forced to shut down the business. I owed $150,000 in debt. I had no, no job and I was kind of left with what am I going to do? I moved back into my parents' basement and kind of found myself at this low of lows. You know, I, I came from having, owning a company and having a motorcycle and, and multiple vehicles to having to go lease a car and not having anything else to my name. And there was one specific night that, that got kind of low and I made myself a promise that I would never be there again. So I got a job in sales, selling uh, lawn and garden equipment and logging and arborist supplies. I convinced my parents to take a home equity out on their house to pay off all my debt. And most of it was to them because they were generous and lent, me, lent it to me. Uh, I wanted them to have their cash back and I had them take out a 12 year home equity loan. I paid, the, I spent the next five years taking every paycheck I got and handing it to them and really didn't live much of a life besides that. I was traveling a lot. I was working 70, 80 hours a week and just kept grinding and kept, kept, kept driving. Uh, I paid off the home equity in seven years is the, the kind of the short story of that part. And uh, then gradually just increased my role. So I went, uh, I got a job offer from a turf supply company selling grass seed and fertilizer and some different type of lawn equipment and took the position. It was a new startup company. Uh, so I, I literally helped build everything with the, with the three guys who started it. And it gave me a good insight into what it took to start a business. And I'd work all day helping them sell and deliver product and then be at the office at night painting the walls and helping lay the tile floors so we could save money. We didn't have to sub any work out. And I stayed there for three or four years and did pretty well. And got to be 90% market share of my territory and still wanted more. I was making okay money, but I was young and still driven and I didn't have a big house or toys or vacations yet. And I wanted all that. I just paid off all this debt. Now I wanted to move on and live a life that I kind of missed out. And uh, that's when I met the, my previous employer. Uh, they were a crane dealer out of New York. They were looking for a person to travel on the road. And I was looking for any opportunity that would help me make more money. And it was always, at that time, always about the money. It, it's kind of changed a little bit now. Uh, not that I still don't like it, but uh, so I started with those guys in November of 2008, not knowing a thing about a crane, not having any idea what I was going to do. And anybody who remembers the calendar remembers that by about the second week in November and 08, uh, the crap hit the fan, so to speak. And I spent two and a half years traveling around meeting customers and nobody wanted to buy a crane. In fact, everybody I walked in the door said, how many do you want? We have a yard full, take whichever yeah, one you need. Because... <laughs> trying to sell you a crane. Yeah, exactly. So I, uh, you know, I used the time it, uh, it was a little discouraging at times, but I used that time to build relationships and to prove to people that no matter what, I was going to still come and see them and be there for them as a resource. And by about the third year, third and a half year, we'd come into Con Expo in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually to the point where I thought I was going to leave and go to a different industry. I was, I, I was working three times as hard as I had ever worked and making half the money. And it was... It was discouraging, but something during Con Expo told me to stick with it and see it out for a little while longer. And that's when I started to catch my groove. And I came back from Con Expo, started selling machines, uh, started to get into some different markets that that company wasn't in prior. And um, you know, went from selling a few cranes a year scratching by to selling 50 cranes a year for them and hiring on service technicians and building an actual location for them. And ultimately after six years or so of them, you know, being employed there, they dangled a carrot and said that someday this is all going to be yours. And I asked for the carrot and they didn't want to give it to me at that point. They didn't want to take on another partner. So with a little bit of, uh, more discouragement, I guess. I, I stayed two more years and continued to hustle, continued to work and give them 110% and uh, decided in the beginning of 2016 that it was time to start looking out for me and not looking out for them. So I, uh, I started thinking long and hard. I was actually going to take a job with Wolf Crane rather than start my own company and uh, take a position running their US market. 
and someone at the last second before I signed the papers came along and said, you should go out on your own, borrow some money, go out on your own. You'll be more successful and you'll be happier and you'll build it for yourself and not for somebody else. So I took their advice and I left my previous employer at the end of uh, June, 2016. I was doing 68% of their total sales. They had 25 people and I was 68% of their total number. And is bought that, the plastic table. Yeah, is that, um, that's, was it, um, were, was that person right? Were you, were you happier? Um, overall when you look at four years? Absolutely. Absolutely. I saw their point. Yeah. And I, this is a tough thing for me to say because I certainly don't want to see any of my team members leave. Not, not that they're all not capable of being on their own, but I don't selfishly want them to go anywhere. I want them to stick with me. Um, but yes, had I taken that position, I would have worked hard. I would have built somebody else's company for them. And at the end of the day, I would have been left with a paycheck and that was it. And now instead I'm, I've got something substantial. It's uh, not to say that it's not stressful. There's stressors now that I never expected. And there's a huge deal of responsibility with it. It's not just me anymore. You know, if I don't sell a crane this week, it, it used to be that, okay, I didn't, I didn't go on vacation that month or I didn't go out to a fancy dinner. Now, if we don't sell a crane this week, there are still 12 other families that are relying on this place doing well and being in business. And that's always a, you know, always a thought in the head. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's also a driver, right? Some days when you, sometimes for yourself is actually not enough to motivate you. Um, you do being, doing it for other people can actually be a huge motivator. There was uh, there's something I, there's just a little thing that you said, working for that previous company, you said you uh, stayed for two years and this is another thing. Um, and I, I, I'm curious about this. There's another thing that you see out there that, um, you know, if you're not happy, move on. And which I think there's, there's can be some real truth to that. Would you think that was the right decision that, that, that two years um, of, of sort of staying with it? Um, was that, was that a good decision? Do you wish you had have not stayed the two years? How do you sort of see that? So this is certain something that I played out in my head for, for about the first year and a half of select Crane, And uh, for me, it was the right decision. Uh, I left money on the table for myself by doing that for sure, because it was two very successful years with that company that rather than getting a percentage of the sales because of that with my commission, I would have had the entire sale, but right. I'm the type of person that doesn't do anything unless I'm mentally ready. And that two years prior, I wasn't mentally ready yet. I was certainly thinking or entertaining an idea of something different, but I wasn't equipped or prepared to go out on my own and do everything that's involved. And when it came down to making the decision in January and starting to set dates and goals and things like that, I was prepared. I was, yeah. I was ready and there was no regrets at that point. And you know, at the, whatever money I may have left on the table during those two years helped prove my concept and helped me refine my process a little bit. Mm. And you know, and get to where I am today or where we are today. I always hate saying I, but yeah. where, where we are as a company today. Yeah. It's, it's that, that two years is interesting because I've thought even for myself, um, when we started this company, I've, it's kind of been two, I, I feel like two years was, we were almost two years too early because we had to do so many changes. And, you know, I think if you're buying an operating company, actually, we had another gentleman on the show that they built attachments and he took on an operating company already. So there was infrastructure in place. But when you're starting and there's, there's not even a name attached to it, you're just mm -hmm. got to come up with it. That I, I, think, I think people should, um, I think it's wise to take at least a year, at least a year. Because I find that sort of the concepts, actually, uh, just, just to wrap up, this, I, don't, I don't know if you know this answer, but when you started thinking about going on your own, to what you, to when you did, um, did the plans that you had change much or was it pretty much the same within those two years? Uh, well, remember the two years prior, I wasn't, I had always had this small idea in the back of my head that I could do this for myself. If I'm doing it for them, I can do it for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I had customers that are great customers and friends to this day pushing me. Why are you, why do you work for them? You could do this on your own. And, and, but even with that, that two years prior, 
I never had the intention of leaving. Oh, I, I wanted to stay with them. I poured my heart and soul into their company to help build it and help make it robust. And, right. and I, I really had this, you know, feeling of being this, you know, huge member of their team and almost family. And so when I had the meeting with them and asked for this, you know, this thing that had kind of been talked about and, you know, so-called promised, I didn't want to leave. I, I loved it. I was going to be there forever. Um, and then when I finally, when we had that meeting and I walked out of it and was told that I'm not going to get what I'm asking for and they're changing their plan a little bit. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I wasn't going to stay there. Right. So it took me the next two years to really decide because I didn't want to jump. I was making good money it, at that point, And that's why I say in the beginning, it was about money. When I first started at the six year mark, when I started to ask for something, I, I was looking for some security at that point. I was, I was kind of at this line of, if I don't do it now, if I don't do something different now, I may never do it. So now is you got to start thinking about it, but I want some security down the road. If they sell this company in 10 years, I'm just going to be some other salesman. Whoever buys them is not going to realize that I brought on three product lines. I was the one who opened up the New Jersey branch. I am the reason that they're doing 50 cranes in this market. I'm just going to be Jason McKenzie, the salesperson who has good numbers. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, there was different ways they could have dealt with it. And I know for a fact, they regret that now, but they didn't see it then. And they didn't understand where I was coming from. And, uh, you know, unfortunate for them, extremely fortunate for me. Yeah. I'm yeah. a thousand times happier. And, uh, yeah, I tell everybody they gave me the biggest favor anybody ever has. They just, nobody realized it at the time. Yeah. Well, it's funny. That's, that's how life goes. It seems quite often. So, you know, Jason, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. I, uh, you know, there's, there's some shows that just sort of, it's, it's, I mean, we have shows that are very technical, the, the engineering on, you know, how exactly the minute detail of how something works. And, and this, it was, it was nice because, you know, getting to know you a little bit, I knew you had, I knew through your journey, you'd actually jumped from a couple different industries. I mean, you'd obviously had setbacks and, and then you reset and then been a part of a company and then gone on your own. It's, it's quite the journey that you've taken. Um, so I, I hope that you'd be willing to sort of unpack it. And so I do appreciate you actually answering those questions and letting me, I, I mean, maybe go a little beyond the more personal than I sometimes get on the show. So I do appreciate that. Well, I can't thank you enough for having me on. And uh, it was, it's been such a great uh, honor to meet you and, and your team during all of this and, and being able to talk to all of your followers. And, uh, yeah. Anytime. I'm an open book, so uh, <laughs> I, I it's hard, hard to make me blush and uh, I, I'm not real shy. So I think yeah. I got the one that was got embarrassed today with the, the uh, whole marriage spiel. So <laughs> <laughs> I had to keep some things back from it, you know, until this day. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Jason. I, I do hope we, we get you and, uh, and yeah. And thanks to get you back on the show and thanks to Shelly for helping uh, keep it so organized. Um, it, it was really helpful to sort of lay everything out and um, I'm looking forward to the end result here. Same here. Thank you again. Thank you everybody for watching. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, you know, it's, it sort of struck me that we've gotten more, uh, we've gotten quite a few crane and attachment and, and part of the reason is um, is because our show goes out to across industry so it's really nice to have these companies that um, that service multiple streams of industry so uh, again thanks Jason for coming on um, thank you everybody for watching please subscribe suggest our next guest a lot of the guests you're seeing now are actually coming from people connecting us or referring or suggesting companies that should be on. And we'd like to keep that going because obviously when you're, you sort of get in a bubble and you can't, uh, you don't know who could be the next guest. So please keep your suggestions coming. It brings uh, a great uh, plethora of companies on. Thank you for watching everybody. Talk to you on the next episode of the Groundsman Show. Thank you for watching. Please remember to subscribe and follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. If you'd like to be on the show or know someone that should be on the show, please email us info at crownsman.com. Again, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our sponsors and we will see you on the next episode.